Thank you. And also on behalf of, of uh, Open Ocean, welcome to this, these afternoon sessions. Um, my dear colleague Katya yesterday mentioned that the world is creating about 20 zettabytes of data every day and, and this pace is accelerating. So it's not because of a lack of data that we might not be making all, always perfect investment decisions. Uh, but actually from that data set, uh, it would be interesting to understand what is actually useful for LPs and for GPs when making decisions. <coughs> And that's what we're going to talk about today. How do these guys think about using data in their business and, and what are they actually doing about it and, and with it? At uh, Open Ocean, as, as an investor in uh, data-intensive software businesses, we, of course, live and breathe and sometimes dream uh, data. However, when we think about it in a, in a practical sense in our data, uh, in our day-to-day operations, yes, we use data and automation to make ourselves more efficient. We try to do that. And yes, we even do use some data science uh, when we evaluate investment targets. For instance, when we look at user bases, customer engagement, and such data sets. But luckily, we haven't yet uh, developed a machine that replaces ourselves as investors. These are the kinds of, of topics we'll be talking about today. And we have a, a panel with some top investors with us who will address these issues. Um, I think we will start by introducing the panelists. Kart, if you would like to, to go first, say a few words about who you are and what you do and so on. Kart from Mojo Capital. We manage a fund that is a hybrid between fund of funds, pocket, and a late stage direct investments. So we invest in other people's funds. We invested in 28 funds in Europe over the last four years, uh, which gives us access to data of about 500 underlying companies in those funds and about a thousand companies in the funds that these management companies have invested in previously. And from those, we source investments for C and D rounds and above. Suranga. Hi, I'm, I'm Saranga. I'm partner at Borleton Capital. We are a London-based pan-European Series A fund. Um, and yeah, I'll tell you more about how we use data shortly. I'm Beezer with Sapphire. For those of you who sat through the introduction on the other panel I was on, I'm, I apologize for hearing it twice. <laughs> We're, uh, Sapphire is a, has two and a half billion under management. Um, the bulk of that is in late stage direct investing, which is done <coughs> sort of differently from Mojo. We keep that in a separate pool. And then we have another team that I oversee that invests in early stage venture funds, US, Europe, and Israel. Hi, I'm uh, Mish. I'm a partner at Local Globe, a seed and pre seed uh, fund based out of London. So, as you notice, we, we will have both the perspective of the LP and the perspective of the GP, and I'm sure some things are, are similar, but definitely we expect to hear about some, some uh, differences as well. Let's start with a very basic uh, topic, and, and I want to start with the two LPs in, in the panel. How do you actually think about data uh, for gaining strategic advantage or efficiencies in, in your business, be it developing strategy, sourcing, opportunities, diligencing them more? Uh, sure. Uh, no, absolutely, data is important. We wouldn't be on this panel otherwise. Um, and it is more important when looking at direct investments because there is pricing involved, uh, which you don't get in fund investments, but that doesn't mean it's not important in fund investments. It absolutely is, and because as Elizabeth was mentioning, our model is such that the same team does both fund investments and direct investments. We try to sort of maybe bring those two sides closer together than traditional, and therefore we pay a lot of attention on the company side of fund investing. So we try to analyze the portfolio companies in the track record. We try to predict um, the return outcomes of these, because obviously track record is historical, but we want to know what's happening in the future, and that's where we mostly apply our data analysis on uh, LP investing. So we love data too. 
Um, in addition to using data to understand company level information, I'd say from a, um, we suck in a lot of data. We basically take all the data that we can possibly get and from an LP sourcing, it's, there's a lot less data than there is from a company sourcing, but we, we track the trends and there's a fair amount of publicly available data which is directionally accurate but not specifically accurate. Mm -hmm. So we can keep essentially a pool, a running tally of who's raised what fund, where and how much. And then you can do, this is pretty simple math, but then you do the calc of like, well, who's gonna be raising next? And that's sort of an LP funnel, just to give you guys an example. Um, we also try to track down a lot of the company data so that we can see trends, not just in our portfolio, but externally on valuations and is, is seed in series A and series B, where is the inflection points? And we track a lot of that on the, we actually do more tracking of that on our LP side um, so that we can be smart about where we're investing and what stage of fund, because as an LP, you're investing in a blind pool and you can't rate, you know, you can't be like, oh no, this month is bad, we wanna go this way, right? You, you have to sort of trust in your GPs and that's the point. So you have a major levers, but not small levers. Let me ask from, from the two of you still, uh, where in your business do you potentially find the most advantage from, from data? Or is it just something that you have to have and everybody has it? Or can, can you create a competitive advantage? And in, in what parts of the LP business uh, would, you, would you be able to do that? I mean, again, I would say that through our access to so many funds and their portfolio companies, you, you can create some sort of an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, because you, you also get a better sense, perhaps, uh, the difference between valuations and exits, which is a, a hot topic currently in, in the client as well. And because um, uh, when you look at sort of publicly available indices uh, from um, Cambridge Associates or something like that, it's very useful to identify top quartile, et cetera, but it is valuations based. And you need to make your own judgment call about how this is going to end up with exits. Um. Well, I don't think this is necessarily proprietary. I think other people can do it if you have the discipline, but we like a lot of the data because a lot of our GPs and us will engage in conversations around recycling or reserves or portfolio construction. And the more examples um, or just more the, more, the more awareness and smarts you have about how different things have worked out, the better you can be as an advisor. Um, and just say, here's historically how it's worked. You know, the future will be the future. But having that kind of experience set through the numbers we found to be very helpful. Um, just as one example of where, again, I think anyone who wants to spend the time can build up that expertise, but it's the dedication to doing it that I think becomes the, the differentiator. Yeah, th th it's interesting that you bring that up because we've, we've seen that. So, um, you know, I think two or three of our LPs um, have proactively reached out to us and said, you know, would you like us to, yeah. because, you know, they ask us for a lot of data, um, which is, you know, often you know, there's, 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 <laughs> so effort, <much> <laughs> there's effort involved in, in providing that to them. Um, but of course we do because we love them deeply. And, um, and, uh, and, and you know, the nice thing is actually the ones who've asked for the most data have turned around and said to us, would you like us to come back and show you what yeah. we get from all of this? And, and it's fascinating. I mean, yeah. I, you know, as someone who's been a, a, an investor now for five years, I'm relatively new to the industry. Um, you know, some of the, some of the um, fund of funds and, and kind of larger LPs have 20, 30 years of data, even more in some cases across obviously, you know, many, many funds and many, many firms and partnerships. And uh, there's some really fascinating stuff. And obviously some of it is, is a little fuzzy here and there, individual attribution and so on can be a bit complex, but I think you can get some fascinating insights. So, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a, if that's a true uh, value, like I don't know if we pick an LP partly because they yeah. offered that to us, and uh, that, that probably seems a stretch, but, but it definitely makes us more positively predisposed towards those LPs and certainly means that we're happy to provide the data when they ask for yes. it next time. Yeah. We, we share that sentiment. As <laughs> yeah. LPs, we do ask for a lot of data. Yeah. And the other thing that we'll do sometimes is um, we'll cut the data and say, like, well, what was the initial check-in? What was the yeah. initial ownership? How does it build over time? Mm. And sometimes you see things, like we've said to some of our managers, you know, you're really excellent at this historically. Mm. Like, do you want to do more? Mm. And they might not, but you sometimes you see trends in the data just because you, everyone doesn't have time to, to play with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah you're good at... Did you know you're very good at getting ownership at an yeah. early stage? Did you know you're not so good at you know managing your reserves? You know yeah. that kind of stuff is you know valuable to us, yeah. right? Super valuable. Yeah. Let's jump into the GP perspective of this this same topic. <coughs> maybe yes. maybe Mish first, uh, thinking about data in your firm, uh, yeah. be it for creating strategy or or going through the investment process or or post. How how do you think about it? 
So I think <coughs> data for us has been, um, has been a major priority over the coming years and increasingly so. Um, honestly, less on the kind of more spoken um, use cases of data uh, around sourcing and due diligence and, and more about around kind of four, uh, I think, key four areas. Uh, and I'll try to provide some quick um, examples. So uh, the first one, kind of in random order, is actually around decision making, uh, investment decision making. So we put a lot of effort and uh, hopefully discipline uh, into systematically capturing the sentiment of each member on, on the investment team, on the broader team, uh, across a wide range of dimensions on each and every portfolio company from the IC every 90 days. Uh, so that kind of gives us a very good understanding of trends within companies, across dimensions, across the portfolio, uh, and giving some benchmarks as to how we should be thinking about kind of initial uh, investment decisions as well as follow-on decisions. Um, and you know, this, is, this is clearly an area where uh, if you have a, a sizable <coughs> portfolio as we do, you really get to see the benefits of scale. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a, a first use case. The second one um, is around actually doing the deals. Um, so I think we've been used like, like all VCs, when you actually make an offer, you start the conversation with the founders, how much do you want to raise, how long for, um, and terms and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and, and that conversation is, is naturally becoming less trivial as the market becomes more crowded. And I don't think it's a secret that London is uh, home to quite a few VCs these days. Um, so we've, one of the things we've done uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, we published a report um, with Deal Room and Atomico um, analyzing kind of systematically the C to Series A journey. Um, and having something like that in hand, you know, we could come back and essentially tell the founders the same thing, but you know, substantiated by data. How much do I want to raise? Probably kind of two to three because that's, that's the good range for successful seed rounds. How long do you need to raise for? Well, probably 18 to 24 months because that's kind of the typical runway up to Series A for funds that, for companies that actually uh, manage to, to raise a, a, a Series A. Um, and then kind of the key question, who do I need to raise from? Uh, and I think we've, we've seen some really interesting data on this. Uh, because now we're in a position to say, well, look, if you look at the data over the past kind of six years, the average European conversion rate from C to Series A has been kind of just under 20%. The average conversion rate among the top quartile funds has been around 40%. Looking at the local globe portfolio, we've seen kind of 50 to 60% consistently across time, sectors, vintages, whatever. Uh, and I think that's, that's sort of a data point that does, uh, does the talking for us, hopefully. Um, so that's kind of the, the second use case. And then two others, uh, which I think are quite straightforward. One is around kind of tweaking the fund model. Obviously, when we start investing from a new fund, we have a certain fund model in place in terms of kind of number of investments for, uh, per fund, check size, going in ownership targets and all of that, but obviously, kind of market changes and then we need to adapt. Uh, and this is where we kind of try to constantly um, stay uh, on top of the data to, to inform that decision where whether we should be kind of tweaking the going in ownership, tweaking the check size um, and this kind of stuff, which is, which is obviously um, important over time. Uh, and then the last one is around actually portfolio support. So providing the portfolio, well, informing ourselves to provide the portfolio better support by having very robust and granular data, both on uh, later stage um, kind of sources of finance and suppliers. Um, so that's kind of a, in, a, in a quick brief. It's a pretty, pretty good nut, nutshell. Sounds yeah. like data, data is very strategic for you. And I would yeah. say, don't be like I am. I feel bad that you don't necessarily do all of the things that he did or they do because 
these guys have obviously been been selected to this panel for the very reason of, of uh, using data data very well. Uh, Suranga Balderton has w as well tried tried a lot of tricks and and <coughs> come to learn that a few of them are are working. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll try to be additive to some of the awesome stuff that Mitch just said. Um, so the uh, we we so we had we had our first data scientist in house six years ago, uh, maybe almost seven years ago now. We've had uh, three people in that role, and they've had sort of teams beneath them. So we've tried quite a few things, um, some of which have worked, some of which haven't worked. Um, I think uh, you know what has worked incredibly well is around diligence. Um, so when we meet a company, particularly one that fits into one of three or four key kind of categories or verticals. <coughs> Um, we ask them for a download of a bunch of their data, which we can then put into a system that we have. And we have a very sophisticated model which compares them to hundreds of companies that we've looked at in their sector over the last few years. So if you're an enterprise software as a service company um, at about a series A kind of level of development, doing maybe between you know, half a million and $3 million of annual, re annual recurring revenue, um, I can tell you everything about how you compare to your peer set. Uh, certainly in Europe and actually increasingly in the US as well because we sometimes get access to some of that data. Um, and that's incredibly powerful for us. It allows us to very, very quickly sort and say, look, this is a top decile or, or whatever, top quartile company in these respects. It's not in these respects. It allows us to prioritize rapidly, which I think if you're a GP like we are, um, looking at probably two and a half, three thousand companies a year and making about 10 investments, you know, prioritization is the biggest problem we have. Um, so it lets us do that. But it's also really high value because it allows us it, it allows us to not just figure out the ones we should spend time with, but actually what the what questions we should next ask them. So you know you're in top quartile for these things, which is great, well done. But did you know that your ratio here is completely out of whack with most other good companies, and why is that? And so that's valuable to us, obviously, because it allows us to sort of dig in on what we think might be the problem with the business. Um, and, and quickly determine if it is or not. But it's also actually really valuable for the founders. So even in situations where we end up not working with an entrepreneur, we've had really positive feedback from some of them saying that they've learned stuff about their business that they didn't know thanks to our analysis, which, which in a way sounds really um, patronizing almost, but actually when you think about it, <coughs> of course that's the case. I mean, they look at one business all day long. We look at hundreds. Why, you know, we should know a bit more about how they compare to the rest of the world. And it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a failing if we don't share some of that back to them, in my opinion. So that's worked really well for us, um, as I say, both to help us make our own decisions, but also hopefully add some value back to them. If we're gonna take their data, we might as well give them something back. Um, the other thing, um, we, we also do do data around um, the companies once they've raised, and so we can do a lot of analysis for them on that, but that's sort of obvious and boring. Two other neat things that we've started doing more recently that I think are worth sharing. One is we, um, we, we've always had a very strong intercompany community. So not just our CEOs, but our CTOs and our CMOs and our CSOs and so on all have active networks that we kind of sponsor through events and things. We've started to convert that into what we're sort of loosely describing internally as the Yelp for services. So basically we're, um, every, you know, every one of our companies is hiring all over Europe and even the US right now. Um, so what we ask them to do is whenever they use a particular recruiter, to post a review, at least give us some grades on what they did well, what they did badly. Um, and an increasing number of our companies are doing this kind of thing. So when the next company comes along and needs to find a salesperson and a CMO and a VP of engineering in these three different cities, they can literally do that search on the system and find out what all of our portfolio companies historically have found worked well in those regions for those roles. Um, and we're doing it for, for hiring, we're doing it for PR agencies, we're doing it for you know, data services and so on and so forth. So there's some really interesting stuff you can do there where you can get the companies to help each other. And again, really, they're providing the data, we're just providing a platform, but I think they get a lot of value from that. And obviously, it's all happening on the Bolton system. Um, and the final, final thing I'll, just, I'll say, which if you do nothing else, I would suggest you do this one, because if nothing else, it will create lots of great um, uh, dinner time anecdotes, uh, is... Um, get a, this is what we did, we, we got one of our data scientists to sit in on partner meetings and in particular um, partner discussions around new investments. And we had him, um, he basically transcribed the data of what we were talking about and how we all voted. Um, and so it wasn't just the scoring that we were using at the time, but also um, why people scored a certain way. So some, you know, someone's a huge fan of a particular investment, why is that? What, what did he or she like about it? Equally, what did this person who didn't like the investment dislike about it? Um, and after doing it for about two and a half years, he compiled it all and showed us a fantastic summary of how we think. 
Um, and um, I, at one point, I was really pushing that we should do a, a great article on this because I thought we'd get, you know, it would be just a, a really a fun article to produce. Um, when we, we wrote the article and then decided it sort of gave away too much, maybe. Um, <laughs> or at least some people felt oh, it gave away too much. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I can't share the highlights. Someone will, some, somebody else will kill me. But, um, but it was really, really fascinating. Some of it is obvious. Like, some of us clearly think very, very similarly about certain things. And, you know, there's a question mark then as to whether we should really count those two people's votes as two or whether we should count it as 1.5 because they're not really adding diversity to the conversation. Um, it, um, there are other people who think very, very differently, thankfully. Um, and I think that's where we get a lot of debate. And some of this, again, anecdotally, I think we all knew. We knew that X and Y always battle over this kind of topic or that kind of topic, but it was good to see it in the data for real. You can also see that some people are perennial optimists, others are perennial pessimists, and so on. And so we, you, can, you can do all of that. I think it's really interesting. The, the, the two outcomes we've had from it are that um, that is now feeding into, we're not currently hiring a GP, but it will feed into the next time we talk to a recruiter about, about um, hiring someone into the partnership. Um, and the second thing that it's doing is it's, it's um, uh, sparked off a bunch of conversations which are leading, I think next week, we're doing uh, unconscious bias training for the entire firm to try and help us navigate some of the biases that we d detected by doing this analysis. So um, it's a really, really interesting thing. And I think, like I say, it's actually the easiest one to do. You just have to be open-minded enough and, and sort of self-confident enough to let a stranger into your room and write a bunch of stuff about what you're saying and doing. It's fas fascinating. Uh, you know, back in the days at the Nokia Ventures organization management team, we had a PhD student and anthropologist do exactly the same. It just wasn't called data science yep. back then. And, and uh, yeah, I think the result was also actually uh, labeled confidential. So I yeah. wonder where, yeah, why exactly. that always happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let, let's talk, we talked a bit about uh, data sets already, but let's, let's get uh, more specific on, on data sets and tools. So, so uh, maybe starting with, with CART, uh, what are the key data sets you use and what are the limitations potentially of, of those and what is maybe the dream data set you'd like to have? Sure, I mean, we feel that we, we have a unique sort of in a way dream data set uh, that is coming from our fund investments every quarter because that is one of the important things of uh, mm -hmm. data that it has to be as standardized as possible and also as uh, sort of regular as possible because uh, we for our sourcing get to use these quarterly figures of the same metrics every time rather than seeing a company just when they are raising, which means that their metrics happen to look great at that moment. Mm. Um, so, so maybe one of the sort of data features that we also get to see is a bit related to survivorship bias, that not only do we get to see what good looks like, but we also get to see what bad looks like, because uh, we don't drop them from the data set just because we might not want to source them. So it's, it's a valuable information for us. Obviously, there is very little standardization across the funds. We have to do that ourselves. And therefore, we do end up with a data set that is sort of a common denominator approach of like, what is it that all of them do report that we can compare? And that is less than any given fund. Like, for example, I would pay a compliment to Local Globe and say that you guys are extremely good at reporting multiple different aspects of data to your LPs. But because not every fund does it, I cannot compare it. Um, and therefore, uh, we do the common denominator in our private data, and, and that is what leads us mostly, but then we complement it with publicly available data. But we always try to do feedback loops to the private data to see like, what we pick up from the public data in terms of trends and uh, predictions. How does it actually translate into revenues, profits, unit economics, because again, our direct investments are later stage, so there is real financial data to compare it to. Yeah. Any specific data sets that you actually acquire and, and what do you think about them? Could they be better? Um, we use Crunchbase quite a lot because we feel that that is perhaps the most complete um, in terms of names in the data set. And they keep adding um, features of data to their marketplace. I think it could be much better in terms of uh, the data that they do report is kind of currently on the sort of app downloads and page views kind of level. It would be much better to get uh, industry specific stuff like average basket sizes churn, but then you 
start running to the confidentiality. So we do have to rely on our fund managers to actually provide that side. Um, so we've, we've experimented, I'll go quickly, we've experimented on ac uh, um, purchasing data to try and help us spot traction in companies early stage. Um, I, this is one area where I'm not a believer in data, I'm afraid. Um, at least at Series A, the reality is the signal is so small um, that, you know, so, you know, you, if you're trying to measure revenue traction of a company that's doing less than a million dollars of revenue, I mean, you know, your local shop around the corner that sells newspapers is going to look amazing. You know, so <laughs> it's, it's, you, you're going to have so much noise. It's really, really, really hard to break into it. People talk a lot about LinkedIn. You know, oh, if lots of great, smart people are joining this company, then that's got to be a good sign. But, you know, if you're investing in companies that have 15, 20 people, then, again, the data is just not, it's just not deep enough. Um, so I'm not a big believer of that. We've, we've tried buying various private versions of that kind of thing. Mm. There are some interesting data sets that basically sell you access to, you know, who's joining which companies, or, you know, um, you can look at, um, you know, app download data, you can look at web usage data, and so on and so forth. I think all of that is either so commodity that everybody has it, um, or it's just too small. So I'm not a big fan of any of that, I have to say. Um, we, we spent a bunch of time kicking the tires on it, and didn't find anything that worked. I'm trying to think of something that's different. Um, I always like the data that Martin pulls around where um, earlier today when he gave his presentation about when you raise, when you start fundraising uh, in one locale, how do you move, how do companies move, and that's something that's at the LP level harder to see. So we're always, because we invest in multiple geographies, I'm always interested in, I'd love to know if there was a way of tracking, like a company gets, gets um, stood up in city A and then how quickly do they come to the States or do they not come to the States? Do you go Stockholm to London, Israel to Germany? You know, whatever it is. I find that fascinating to then see how that overlaps with where people fundraise from. Um, but it's really, really hard at the LP level because it's not captured when companies start offices and then one becomes a de facto office. Like, I don't know if one could, but that's data I wish was easily available that at least we haven't found out a way of doing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have to echo Saranga's point about the usability of kind of commercial data sets, at, uh, even more so in our stage, yeah. uh, in a way. Yeah. Um, so our focus uh, across the different use cases I mentioned uh, has definitely been around kind of proprietary internal uh, data that we need to, we're constantly working on the processes to capture it in a, in a systematic, reliable way. I think uh, very much like Boulderton are doing, uh, we've, we've, we've been trying to kind of leverage the scale of our portfolio to learn a bunch of stuff around kind of suppliers, for example. Uh, but then, you know, coming up with processes that are um, useful in terms of capturing data, but not burdensome on the companies and actually kind of um, interwoven into their workflows, it's, it's not straightforward. So that's kind of constantly work in progress. Um, a kind of a bit of work we did with more commercial uh, data sets. Uh, so we've been mostly working with DealRoom just because we found that they, in terms of European data, they have the best coverage uh, compared to any of the other commercial platforms. Uh, and when, when you say you found, how did you find that out? Well, hmm. we've kind of looked deeply. <laughs> <Exactly>. uh, <laughs> but uh, no, as in, uh, we, we specifically checked kind of numbers of rounds of companies of, of funds across Europe and uh, it's been it's it's been historically the case that most of the other uh, platforms have been focused on on the US market uh, essentially but and so I think that saying it, it, this was more a volume uh, based well it's criterion. just coverage yes just in terms of the how hermetic the coverage is uh, which is obviously uh, important if you want to do reliable. Um, but do you then double, double check against, for instance, your own sources on your own portfolio companies and, and how accurate that, that so, actually is? So some of it, uh, so just as an example, uh, building up on the previous analysis we've done, uh, we've now been working with Dilroom on a more kind of detailed analysis of the Series A, la uh, series a landscape. So we actually wanted to come up with some data on uh, the shift from what we call old Series A, kind of four to seven million range, to uh, new Series A, kind of seven to 15 million range, and the emergence of mega Series A beyond that, and who are the investors that actually lead those rounds across Europe over the past five years. 
Now, if you try to look um, at commercial platforms, that is very difficult to do because you get a bunch of investors, but you don't know who actually led the round most of the time uh, and who you know, kind of did a follow on, did a small check, and that's kind of not the data you are trying to capture. So we've actually been working together with Dealroom to <coughs> approaching each of the kind of key uh, or most active Series A investors across Europe to, to build that data set and hopefully we'll be able to publish that in a few weeks time. Um, but uh, you know, that's useful information, not just to our portfolio, but to the entire kind of seed ecosystem because it's useful for founders to know, for example, um, you know, the, the founders enamored with the idea of raising their A from a US fund. Well, <coughs> actually, if you look at the most active Series A investors, and sorry, it's still in the making, but I can say as much, uh, you will not find a US fund within the top 20, probably not within the top 30. So you can try, but it's not very likely. So kind of managing expectations, important. Um, if you want to know kind of which fund to approach and you want to raise like a, let's say, five million pound round, well, you shouldn't, probably you shouldn't spend too much time with uh, funds that have only done uh, kind of Series A rounds of you know, 12 to 17 million. Yeah. Um, so taking all of that into account, and then there's also the volume. So Bolderton, for example, is by a large margin the most active Series A investor in Europe over the past five years, which I think many seed founders do not really appreciate. Um, so just making all of that data accessible to our portfolio, but also to other uh, founders at, at the seed stage uh, is something we, we think makes the whole conversation more informed. I just want to underscore this. This is, as an LP, this is information that is really, really, really hard to get mm. because you have to, I mean, in the Europe is somewhat contained, you can get a sense, but it's, yeah. it's amazingly helpful for the ecosystem. Yeah. And you see people trying to do this in the States and it's just a lot harder because there's just so many more entities, mm. right? Yeah. People will track what Sequoia and Benchmark do as a way of narrowing it down, but it's, anyway, so thank you for doing it. Really no, I, I, actually, I'm, I'm mostly thankful to the kind of collaborative tone we got from everyone. And I think that is one of the uh, great features about the European <laughs> venture. Uh, yeah. Like you reach out to people, you actually get answers and data, and it's it's yeah. relatively easy to get this uh, kind of stuff done because mm -hmm. people are are happy to share and help. Uh, so, um, in that sense, the, it's been great. It's, yeah. I mean, lis listening to you guys, it's clear that there are no shortcuts. The you know, free, free for higher data sets uh, exist, but might not be perfect. And therefore it's, it's clearly long-term hard work uh, to build the data sets that work for your purposes and your firm. Uh, what, what does it require investment-wise? I mean, how do you resource that? What kind of tools do you, do you use uh, if, if you want to uh, disclose any? And uh, is it actual data scientists? I mean, Boulderton has had a data scientist for six years, but is this university level statistics or deep, deep data, data science? So our first person was um, phenomenal uh, machine learning, data science, PhD, et cetera. Um, he didn't work out. He's a great guy, um, good friend of the firm still, but it actually it, we don't have a volume of data that, that requires that level of understanding or analysis. Uh, most of what we're talking about when we talk about data is is just uh, actually I think for many other industries pretty standard stuff you know it's just collecting numbers and doing a bunch of math a um, bunch of addition subtraction and multiplication on most of it not even division half the time um, <laughs> so you know it's, it's not like it's, it's super super complicated stuff it requires someone with a commercial mindset to understand what's actually an interesting sum to do and what isn't so, um, so actually you're saying not even university level I, no <laughs> I, I didn't say that um, no so I the, you know the young woman who we have actually running the whole program now she is amazing. She came out of Goldman, um, and then she was at Google for a couple of years. She has an analytics background, but I don't think she'd ever describe herself as a pure data scientist. Um, and then the other thing, which is true of any, I mean, anyone who works with portfolio companies that do a lot of data science will know this, um, you can have all the data scientists in the world. Actually, you, what you also need is engineers who can actually build the systems. Um, One-offs are one thing. Obviously, data scientists are great at doing that. But if you want to build a system that's constantly evolving, constantly capturing data, you need to hire engineers as well. So we've had to do that too. Um, and you have in-house engineers doing that? Yeah, we do now. I mean, we didn't always, um, but it, it's, I mean, to do it really well and really efficiently, you end up doing it that way. So it's a pretty big investment, I would say, um, but I think it's worth it uh, for the output that we get. One Just minute to go, any further? Oh, 
No, just uh, quickly uh, on that, so we, we also have an in-house uh, um, data scientist, but honestly, the, the challenge with making use of that data has been less about you know, kind of complicated data science. It's been mostly about, and we're lucky enough to have a data scientist who is also kind of a full stack engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, yeah, it, it's, it's helpful. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, the key priority is one, building robust data pipelines to make sure that all the relevant data is coming from all the CRMs and all the survey system and all the node system and whatever it is. Uh, and most VCs, I think uh, we know have at least, I don't know, five or 10 or 15 product, products used in their kind of tech stack. So that in itself is not a straightforward uh, um, kind of effort. And then on top of it, there's the question of productizing that data, making kind of making that data accessible in a useful way that kind of works with our internal workflows. Um, so again, I think like everyone else, very much work in progress. Un unfortunately, we run out of time, but uh, the great panelists will be available here, and I'm sure some of you would like to talk further about them, how they are, are solving these, these uh, opportunities. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I heard from Adam Street that they've done a, a, an analysis of, of the market of AI, ML-driven new types of players, new, new types of funds in the market. They haven't publicized this information yet, but what they did tell was that, that on the question of will the machine replace the investor, the furthest they've seen actually now working in the market is that the machine has a seat on the investment committee. So <laughs> one vote on the investment committee. And I think uh, as the machines get smarter, next time we'll, we'll tackle that, that question more, but, but it, it, it's quite clear what the trend is. So we next time a, we are adding we a machine a here, uh, make separate space, a separate desk for it. I think we need to thank the panel for taking the time, getting prepared, and I'm actually very happy to see that I'm not the only one struggling with all the data for the last 17, 20 years that I'm doing and crunching my data. Anyway, let's give it a big hand. Thank you very much.